What's up guys, today's lesson is all about user interface design principles. It's super exciting, it's about six or seven I'm gonna go over, and at the end of this lesson, you're gonna have a much maybe better understanding of the key things you should be looking out for when you start UI design, what things are, do I think the most important? I've been doing it for 15 years, so over that time I've definitely evolved as a designer, and I look at different things now I look at things differently than when I started. So hopefully I'll give you a little glimpse into some of that stuff. So let's get started. The first thing we're gonna talk about is, maybe it's a new thing, maybe five or six years ago, the industry completely changed. And I'm gonna talk about UI design languages. And these have other names like design systems, but we need to talk about it briefly because if you're looking to go into UI design, this is gonna completely affect your whole career, really. So. I've worked on a couple of different teams who make UI languages. So I made the one for Barclays. I have worked in other companies who do these big UI languages and now I use one. A UI design language is simply, it's a consistent set of elements that as a designer you will use when you go into a big company. I mean, you know, it's not even big companies anymore. It's just a company that has a, like more than one website. Then you're gonna, you're gonna to have to use a UI language. And it, it's not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing in, in many ways. So a UI language consists of things like buttons. They'll look at typography. It'll have like things like tables and all the elements that you use when you design the website. And at first, like, I remember if I, if I would have had this when I came into the industry, I would have been a bit frustrated and been like, oh, I can't put my own spin on things. But the, the reason why I've changed my mind over my career and I think UI languages are good now because I've seen companies who have like 30 different websites and they all look completely different because you'll get every every designer, you know, wants to put their own spin on things. But when you're in a big company, it's actually a hell of a lot of wasted work, really, because across all these websites, you think about it, you design a website, you, you have a development team. Maybe there's five or six developers and other people, they have to then make what you design and they implement it and then it's not reusable and that's the key word here reusable and that means money for companies at the end of the day so if i have a design language now and i've got 20 or 30 sites or maybe even two or three if i do the work up front and design the button design the logo design the icons then they can be reused in perpetuity like no matter like forever and ever no matter who comes in and it's a good thing because then if you make an update, it can be applied across all of your designs and you can all keep to the same design ethos. But that's why I've kind of changed my mind on it. And also when you work in tools like Figma, Sketch, Adobe XD, they, they've got really good ways of creating a design system. And you know, if there's 10 designers, you all share the same files. And the reason why it's not as frustrating as it might first appear is because it actually allows you as a designer it gives you a bit of freedom actually from thinking about elements and it lets you think about the bigger picture and this is always the most important because when you don't spend time producing 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 like buttons text the same things over and over again you actually think about different things so it's the 20 percent that you think about but that's the important 20 percent and it really makes a difference but we'll talk about um a couple of other things, but that's just an introduction to what a UI language is. And you'll probably come across it in your career. You'll either make one for smaller companies or you will um, use one for bigger companies. And that's fine. It creates consistency, it creates usability, and it just ensures that everything's a bit more, just a bit more even. But th what I want to talk about now is what is actually more important than the 20% is hierarchy. So this is by far the most important thing that I've learned over my career as a designer that you should think about. And it's the hierarchy of how you place things on a website. So this is a bit of mix of UX thinking and UI together. And I know a lot of people are hybrids and mixtures and we all like to think about different things because we're not cheap. But when I talk about hierarchy, it's every page that you design, whether it be an app, whether it be a watch design or whether it's a website there's there's something that you want someone to do on that page and that's not manipulation it's just you wouldn't have made the page if there wasn't an action for someone to perform at the end otherwise it's a waste of time for everybody so really think about when you create a page what the action is you want someone to do and put that front and center and then build the whole page around 
telling someone why they should perform that action. So if you wanted the, someone to click sign up to do a contact form or something, put that button at the top. And you know what? I'm not scared of big chunky buttons. Make things big so people can see them. I've sat in enough user tests to know that things are too small on the internet and we need to cater, you know, people, I think people, when you see something simple, it makes you feel relaxed because I've seen designs sometimes and you know what? There's like a table and there's like 40 things on it. It makes me feel overwhelmed. But when there's two or three things and it's neatly laid out, I feel more relaxed and I'm certainly more inclined to perform the action that you want me to. And it's not a bad thing because I might want to perform that action as well. At least I have the relevant information up front to know what I'm getting into before I do that. So really think about hierarchy. Think about your titles, your descriptions, where things go. And think about having a primary call to action. So a CTA is a button, that's what we call it, a call to action. Have that at the top and then further on down the page, it should be supplementary call to actions, which will reinforce the main big idea. So the person, the user might not be ready to commit at first, but as they read down more information, the same call to action should be repeated. You can use different words, but maybe contact now, contact us. Do you want more information? You know, it could all point to the same thing. And that's why you really need to think about hierarchy. It's super important. And because now you have a design language, you can actually think about some of the things that actually emotionally have a, an effect on people. It's really important, really, really important. So sorry, I've got my little book down here. So I'm just taking some notes. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about. Yeah, so I've already talked about like sizing and uh, creating emphasis on a page and this can be done in a couple of ways. So when you create a website, you have different uh, hierarchies of text. So you'll have big titles, smaller titles, and then you'll have body copy and things like this. And what I don't want you to be scared of is making things big. Like I've just talked about big chunky buttons. Whenever I make a website, I literally make the biggest button I can because I know more people are going to click on that than not. I mean, this is something you can test as well. Like there's, there's a great website called uh, IFTTT, if this, then that. And for years and years, I've loved their website because it's just simple. It's just big text on a white background with some colors to emphasize what I'm actually doing. It makes me feel calm. It makes complex, because it's a very complex website because you're combining things together and you do, you're actually performing a task. But because it's simple, really don't be scared to think about simplicity as a as a ui designer because it just makes people feel better don't think you need the biggest the flashiest the most dynamic text on a website because none of that stuff matters because people are coming to your website not as a piece of art but as a piece of functionality and that's the reason why books are so popular you know people still read books even though there's films even though it's just text because it's the story that you're trying to get across at the end of the day and as a designer really try and strip that back and try and just show the most like simple information you can and you'll go very far in your designs so the next thing we're going to talk about is um along with sizing you need to think about responsiveness as well and a lot of this will come inside the actual design language so you might not need to think about it so much but if you're creating one so we work on three different main screen sizes now and you know there's about a million billion different devices but Whenever people design websites, you can either design mobile first, where you start with the smaller screen and work up, or you can design desktop first, start on the biggest one and work down. Because the the information will be laid out differently on the different devices. So you might have like a horizontal, it's called a hero at the top of the page, it's like an image with some text on it, but that will look dramatically different on a phone than it will on your on your desktop because it will go more vertical on the phone and that's how things tend to do if you have three things next to each other on a desktop website they tend to stack vertically on a phone so phone pages are super long whereas work desktop pages are wide so you need to think about some of these things but what the most important thing is is that you view them on the device because sometimes you'll design something in your screen app and you'll think it looks because there's so many so i have a 5k iMac and it's like I can see really small text, but then when I get it on a phone or something, it looks too small. So make sure you check it on a device. Uh, think about responsive design. And because, you know, a lot of people are using mobiles now even more than using their desktop. Um, you know, you'll hear a lot of people, like there's so many people have said this to me over my career, they go, you should design mobile first. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say what I think. It's the, it's the uncool opinion, but I've always started desktop first and you know it's never it's never bothered me it's never hindered how I design I design desktop first and then I stack everything for mobile and then check it 
and there's like philosophies about these things but just ignore it and just do whatever feels right to you don't let other people change the way you design because at the end of the day it's just opinions there's no right or wrong so you know what desktop first it, it doesn't really matter whatever you want to do if you want to start with mobile you start with mobile it's it's perfectly fine the next thing we just need to quickly talk, touch is accessibility so whenever you design something on the web um, there's a lot there's a lot a lot a lot of people who have disabilities who use the internet and there's things in the user interface that will affect people with disabilities so I, i've seen this so you know in london when you go on the tube if you've ever seen it there's like a tube map and there's um say there's six different lines and they're all just lines and originally i think don't quote me on this but Say they're all different colours, yeah, but someone who's colourblind will come up to that and they'll look at it and they might not be able to distinguish between red and brown, for example. And when those lines overcross or they get jumbled up, the actual map is really, really inaccessible to them and, and it's quite important because they, they don't know where they're going. And, and this could be on the screen design as well. There's, there's websites where you can check accessible colours and you can put the hex code, which is the actual mathematical value of your color into it and it will tell you whether it's a web safe font which means it's accessible but the way the london underground got around this is they put dashed lines they put like horizontal dashed lines they put solid lines they put double lines so they give each line a different actual stroke as well as a color and then it looks like for people who have normal vision or can see all the colors it looked it looked even better because they could distinguish by two different things. So really think about accessibility, especially if you design a big website. Like I've done some websites for like the BBC, which has a billion people look at it year. So you've really got to think about some of these things because it might not be so important if you design like a boutique website, but when you design a big one, there's so many people that you need to cater for. It's something that you definitely should think about. So the next thing we're going to talk about is typography. So this is fun. Like you could do a whole course in typography, but when you design a website, there's you don't need to know too much about typography because there's, there's basically two types of typography. There's sans serif and serif. So serif fonts have a little, it's like a, it's like a decorative touch on the letters and it's a bit more old fashioned. You'll see it in books like Times New Roman. So you'll have an S and it'll be like, you'll have little things on it. And then you've got sans serif, which means without thing. <laughs> I don't know what the actual Latin is, but it means without. And it, it's a lot more modern. It comes from like a, like, like a movement in Swiss design. And they're your two main, uh, main type of fonts. And you can combine them on a website. Sometimes you look at fashion magazines and they'll have serif fonts everywhere. So the title will look old fashioned and then you'll have more modern type throughout it. So just understand the two basic things. What do you want if you're designing something? Maybe you're a lawyer or a solicitor. Then you'll want to go with uh, a serif font. It looks just a bit more traditional and professional. But then if you're a designer like me, I'll just have some serif fonts all over my website because it's a bit more, I get, you know, it's modern, but like it comes from like 100 years ago. So that's kind of how things work in art very, very slowly over time. So they're the two types of fonts. And, you know, think about your colours to a certain extent so whenever you have black on white it's actually quite harsh and I did lots and lots of research in this when I was working for Wired magazine we we, we designed for the iPad um, and we actually tried we actually tried different colours of black so you can have black you can have dark grey dark grey and we found the best colour was 60 60 60 in RGB values and it's, it's slightly dark grey but it looks a lot better than black it's not as harsh and it looks good so maybe just experiment with the. you can have different shades of black um, or 50 shades of grey so um yeah experiment with them try and and see what you think but this type of and, and don't use too many fonts so um maybe use like one or two fonts on a lot of websites i just use one so you could use like a website a font called gotham and there's gotham light there's gotham italic gotham bold and as long as it's all in the same like a family of fonts it will look great so don't do times new roman and comic sans together it just the blending of the two fonts, they have different meanings and different feelings and it, it's not great. So try and keep them in one or two font families for some of the things that you're trying to create. The next thing, yeah, let's talk about colour. This is this is a good one. I've actually got a full video on a colour theory for designers. So you could talk for 25 minutes about this. Colour affects people emotionally. It affects how they feel about things. And there's some great resources if you're thinking about putting color together for a website so adobe have a website and what you can do is you can go on there and there's lots of different 
Um, people have already made them. You can go to the explore section and see the different color palettes that people have put together. So maybe you'll use five colors on a website. You need to think about how they blend together. Think about the overall emotion you're trying to do. So if you're doing a bank, maybe you'll use blues and greens because that's a bit more peaceful and it's a bit more professional. People think about money when they have those colours. If you're doing maybe like a crazy surfing website, you might have bright yellows, bright reds and a blue for the sea. So you'll try and recreate the sunset. But think about those. Check out Adobe Colour because you might have a look at the trending ones. That Yeah, you can have colours that are trending. So you might look at the trending ones, see what other people have created and you might find one that just works for you so really think about color and think about each color has an emotion so check out color theory it's really interesting if you're interested in this but each 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 color gives someone an emotion and it means different things in different cultures so yellow means happiness in some cultures but in greece it means sadness so really think about where you're doing the color for and find a nice color scheme that matches so the next thing we're going to talk about ah so the, the last two things are images and illustration so these are things that you can apply to your user interface so you've got a nice simple site you've got nice fonts you've got a simple color scheme then this is where the magic happens i guess because you should see how like amazing a website is transformed by a good choice a good so it's called art direction when you choose the photography you don't need to be a great photographer or an illustrator i work the magazines and you, you work with a lot of you work with the people who go into photography and the people who go into illustration your job is to choose the best that match the overall style and put it in so i'm going to give you a couple of resources so the first one is unsplash.com whenever you put photography on your website you need to be a million percent sure they're using royalty free images you can't go to google and copy and paste images because a lot of them are copyright and you just don't want to get into any legal trouble you want things to be done a certain way don't go on don't go on these stock photography websites i've seen people copy them and then like there's a watermark over it and go on photoshop and change it just don't do any of that it's, it's not respectful to the person who took it because it's their business and unsplash.com everything is licensed you can use it wherever you want. It's all super high quality. You can download these massive files. So the problem with ripping other people's images is they're all low res anyway, so they're not great. But check out unsplash.com. It's the world's best place, or not the world's, but it's my favorite place for getting them um, royalty free images. And there's so many that you can choose from to make your website amazing. So check out unsplash.com. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about illustration. So very similar, on draw.com is another place on draw.com is a place very similar to unsplash where you can get amazing royalty free illustrations designed by a great designer there's so like i look at technology ones and there's so many hundreds to choose from and you can get them get the illustrator file you can change them a little bit i've seen websites where they change the color slightly on them but yeah the key is choose like you can even pay for them adobe have a great stock image portfolio if you have some budget a lot of people don't that's why i advise going to unsplash but just be aware that a lot of other people will use the same images if you're using unsplash or under and it might look the same as those websites so if you've got some money go on over to adobe stock purchase some great photography it'll be a lot less used and more unique to what you're doing but these two things bring your website alive and you can even apply like filters to your photography so there's a design trend at the moment called Duoterm, where you're only using black and white and one or two colors. And a lot of people say you're using orange as your color. You'll apply like an orange filter across the whole image. So even though the images all look different, they blend in with the style of your photography on the website. You might like the matrix, you saw the green hue over the images. You know, it, it had that kind of film grain vibe. So think about maybe you could apply this film if you want. I don't, I just use them raw or well, think about like there's the certain things when you use images. So a lot of people have a hero, like we talked about at the top, which is image text. So you can't just have text on top of the image. It doesn't really work. Sometimes you need to put like a black in between it, like a 50% black. So it deepens the, the, the contrast. You're looking for contrast between your text and the image. You can do it sometimes. Say you had like just a sky, like a blue sky with a little sun in it. You could put white text on it. So this is the bit that like get everyone on stock is text over image especially when you're working responsibly so you're going down to a mobile the tech like the image crops at different spots and the text will stack so that's why i advise you to put like just i'm not one of these people for fancy things i don't like a blur or anything just put a black and just put like a 50 percent opacity on it it'll look great play around with the opacity and it'll make things better for you 
So there are all the principles I've got written down. I hope this lesson or this introduction to UI language or UI design has given you like a taste for it. So just think about it. You know, it's all about reusability, simplicity, accessibility, fonts, colors, images, emotion. Bring all those things together. Don't make it too complex. Make sure your hierarchy is right. I'd say that's the number one thing. Make sure it's simple. Make sure it's readable elegant and you know you can create a lot of great designs by being simple and allow your artistic flares to come out in other things like poster design or things where people aren't really using them but they're again a bit more, more emotion from them so until next time guys keep designing and keep things simple